फिर से सारी बातें जो नहीं करनी थी कर डाली माँ Do I take it away? Here we are, another episode of uh, the broadcast. Yes, a podcast of two brothers. My name is Ahmed Bashar Sayed. I am Nazir Sayed, uh, and today we have the honor of having Matt Whitecross with her, with us, uh, and he is formerly, you know, well known as the director of uh, Supersonic, a uh, documentary on the Oasis, and A Head Full of Dreams, uh, which was a documentary on Coldplay. So Coldplay, thank yeah. you for taking the time out, Matt. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to real quick start on um the Coldplay documentary real quick. Uh, me and my brother and a and a, a bunch of our friends went to see it the only night that it was um playing in theaters, and it absolutely knocked our socks off. It was beautiful. It was colorful. It was magnetic. We went and saw Coldplay when they came to Toronto, and the way you captured the essence of that concert plus the story of the friends, it was. Amazing, and then that's how we kind of linked up because then I wrote about you and I sent you the article, and then you read it. I don't remember if you know this, and then you totally you you tweeted back at me. I tweeted back at you, and it was just that whole experience of from watching the movie to letting you know that it meant a lot to us was amazing. So I want to thank you for that. Oh, thank you so much. It's really it's so lovely because we were in a bit of a bunker making it. For a couple of years, and obviously twenty years before that, and it was quite weird to actually kind of release it out into the open and see what people made of it. But it was it was very sweet of you, and I think it's oh. um it's a very obviously it's a very personal film, even though it's about such a big band. Um, so it was it's an unusual project in a lot of ways, and we're and not one that we ever really expected to finish or that it was going to come out. So it was a kind it was a funny one because um we were in the end, you know, I, it started with me filming just just a few friends and then it ended with them becoming this this huge phenomenon but still making the film with just a few friends it was just kind of three or four of us in an office yeah so it was quite it was the process of uh hearing people talk about it afterwards has been lovely because it's it was we were in such a bubble you know unusually even for a documentary that it was uh yeah you kind of never really got as far as anticipating what the next step would be and how people might react so thank you very much I want to actually talk about how you got into directing and uh, filming movies and editing. Um, just so can you tell me a bit of like a background about that? Yeah, well, I so I like probably in common with a lot of people. I grew up loving movies. My parents both movie lovers, particularly my dad, uh, lovers of different kinds of films. Like my dad was really into kind of um, like fifties and sixties gangster films, but he loved everything. My mom was more art house. And they were um, they were political exiles from Argentina, um, but my dad was born in in England, but my mum was from Argentina, so they'd met over there. They were put in prison over there, and they came over. So they had quite an eclectic, strange kind of range of different um, types of influences and and tastes. They would have these this weird record collection, which was like all kind of Latin American music, but then a lot of things like the Rolling Stones or Frank Zappa, but all with. Yeah like with Latin American titles because everything's in Spanish and then they'd come over and they'd love certain kinds of films. I think they grew up in a generation where if you were like a middle class smart couple, you would go and see the latest film, like the kind of art house release, so they do like the new Fellini film or the new Pasolini film, whatever it might be. Yeah. And so I, so I grew up with them. I kind of, I, I was educated through their love of film, but it was, it's a very different time to now where, we kind of have everything at our fingertips. You know, if, I, if mm-hmm. you mention a film, I can probably be watching it online five minutes later. Whereas yeah. back then, my dad would talk about these films that he'd seen and he might even buy me a book or we'd go to the library and I could see pictures, like black and white images from some of these films and he'd tell me the stories, like Kiss to the Spider Woman or something, he'd describe them to me, but yeah. maybe I wouldn't get to see them two or three years later. Yeah. And so, I, so that's, that was the beginning of my education about films. And we'd just watch films. We only had four channels. And the, you know, the, especially Channel 4 would tend to have the best films on, but normally at two in the morning. So yeah. either I would stay up all night waiting for it, or you would, and you'd have to wait, and all the, they'd have the ads in the middle and all that sort of thing. Or you'd try and tape it and normally miss the beginning or the end or something yeah. like that going on. So it was a very different time. Um, but, I, but you really, a bit like people say about music now, you really savoured it then. So like, I would read in the paper that they were going to show Citizen Kane in a month's time. And I would count the days till it came on the TV and then I would record it and then I'd watch it 10 times afterwards with like me and family and friends. So it was, it was unusual because I think now I, like in common with my 
the, everything that I have on my phone, I have access to most of the films that have ever been made on the planet. And yet yeah. I end up not watching any of them. <laughs> yeah. Watching the same five films. And the same with my five favorite albums. I just end up do, doing them repeat, which is ridiculous. I mean, it's partly just to do with having young kids. So anyway, I, I knew I wanted to try and be involved in films and I just didn't know how. Like my, my dad and my mom didn't know anyone involved in films or filmmaking. Um, but I, you know, I, he, had, he bought a, a, a camera for the family. Again, you know, phone, phones didn't exist like that. Mobile phones didn't exist. We didn't have any of the technology that you have now. So I would take the family video camera and we'd make films and we'd have to edit it in the camera. Yeah. So I, would, so my <laughs> I remember would say this a line. Yeah. Right. So my brother would say a line, I'd say a line. So I'd have to think, which I think in some ways is quite a good education because I couldn't, you know, you had to make your mistakes and you could make them all at home and we'd come up yeah. with an idea and then you'd suddenly realize we'd missed the line or we, it didn't make any sense. You kind yeah. of learnt the grammar of film by accident in a way. Did you also, uh, did you did you go to school for filmmaking or did you go to school for something else? No, I never did. So I, after I finished, I knew that's what I wanted to do, but I didn't, really didn't know how to do it. Um, but I'd be making little films on, on my video camera with friends. And so I, and then I, I loved reading and I, I thought, well, everyone wanted me to go to university anyway. I loved the idea of going there. So I was like, well, look, I'll, I'll study reading. I'll study English literature. I'll enjoy that because I know I'll, I'll enjoy it anyway. And then, and it's storytelling. It's the same kind of thing. And while I was there, I mean, I was at set, you know, UCL was somewhere where Christopher Nolan, even though he wasn't famous yet, he'd been there kind of five years ago. I before, love Christopher. He's one of my favorite directors of all time. Yeah, me too. He's, he's incredible. He's, yeah. he's, he's right up there with any of any filmmaker you mentioned. So, because that was kind of amazing. And he, his first film came out while I was there, so I got to interview the actors. I didn't meet him, but, but I got to interview the actors. So it was, it was just somewhere I thought that like, I'll go there and you know, the filmmaking thing is what I really want to do. It'll probably never happen, but yeah. I might meet people and maybe I'll find something else. And my, you know, my mom was like everyone else's mom, wanted me to have some kind of security and some safety. Yeah. I don't know how much an English degree would have helped then or now. But I'll like, tell you. I feel like you're talking about his life right now. I'll tell you right now. I I am an aspiring writer as well, and I have a poetry book out as well, which I will get to. It links with Coldplay really nicely. But uh, it it was one night when I tell when I told my dad that I wanted to pursue writing, especially in a in an immigrant household. That's like a no go area, right? So it it was very difficult for me to translate to my parents that this is something I'm good at and passionate about. Because um, mostly the, uh, the immigrant household uh, sort of pushes your dreams in the back burners. And they're like, first have a safety net, make sure that you're earning well and all that. And then, of course, you can go on and pursue. Like one of my favorite authors is Khalid Husseini, who first had to pursue five to eight years of, of medicine, started practicing medicine before he ever wrote a word. And sure. like that's sort of the path that um, my parents wanted me to take, which was still a... It's the, we still argue about it every day at the dinner it's table. It's a hot debate. <laughs> he knows about it. But um, I totally, I totally get what you're saying with that. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I'm married. So, yeah, my parents, my dad was British, so he had a slightly different experience of it. But my mom was from Argentina, so they had a very kind of uh, elevated, privileged version of the yeah. immigrant experience. But even so, I think it was very dislocating and difficult for her. Yeah. And, you know, she had to abandon her family. She couldn't go back. They couldn't come to England. Mm -hmm. And so that was difficult. And I think, yeah, you know, they were, they were, they didn't know anyone who'd done that. And so it's like, look, they knew plenty of people who'd gone and worked as journalists. They knew plenty of people who worked in human rights. They knew pl plenty of people who'd become doctors and so on. But they didn't know anyone who worked in film. And so that yeah. just sounds scary straight off. And I think the same thing with my wife. You know, I think her, she's a doctor. Her mom's a doctor. Her brother's a doctor. Her, you know, every, everyone's yeah. a doctor. And that's, yeah, that's the family business, you know. And it's, and it's got, there's a tried and tested route. You work your ass off and then you end up with a great job at the other, the other end and a tough yeah. job. But, you know, so that, it all makes sense. Weirdly, I think Weirdly, with, I think in, with Iran, in Iran, they, because uh, she's Iranian, Iranian. they also they do, also really revere artists in a way that yeah. they, it's very interesting because I think in Britain especially we tend to have a slightly self-deprecating view of ourselves often yeah. anyway whatever you do but particularly yeah. with well, I mean, people probably wouldn't even call it art so when you, call, you you make films I think me and my friends tend to think of ourselves much more as you know filmmakers we're craftsmen you kind of come up with an idea you craft it together it's a communal thing it's not a yeah. kind of grand vision of any one person even if you've got a, a burning story that you want to tell you're still yeah. cobbling it together you kind of slightly 
yeah, you're slightly modest about it, humble about it, because I don't know. I, I love the idea. There are plenty of geniuses out there, but the way that I've always, what I love about film is you work as a team and you surround mm-hmm. yourself with friends and other and clever people who all bring something to the table. Definitely, so I, yeah. I never, but, but, but talking to my wife's family, they're all very much like, no, it's film is art. Storytelling is art. And it's very, it's held in great esteem over there, which yeah. is always quite nice to, to hear because you do have yeah. to remind yourself. It's like, yeah, of course, your health is the most important thing. But then yeah. why are you healthy? Why are any of us here? Like we exist, we're, we're storytelling animals. We yeah. love to try and in- interpret our place in the universe by telling, you tell me your story, I tell you mine. We we come together in the middle. Hopefully I learn something, you learn something. That's the way we, we all evolve. I don't think it's That's more evident than, than what we're going through now because all of us are stuck at home and what are we doing to make the time go by faster or to make the time go by better? We're watching movies. Like me and my brother binged supersonic and a head full of dreams back to back two nights ago and that's a whole different experience like you go from supersonic to head full of dreams and then like very different bands very different stories to tell and but like the whole point is that like that's what we're coming back to stories and storytelling consuming and the, art and consuming art and and that's basically what we're here to do i think that's uh in the most finest forms i i you know i grow up i can only really you know obviously if you if you want to be a filmmaker, you have a maybe a slightly more extreme version of this, like you feel maybe even more intensely about it. But I only have yeah. to look at how people are talking about things on Twitter and on Instagram and so on since they've been locked in their homes and they're finding things resonant with them in certain ways. And I, I definitely feel like I grew up as you know middle class kids in the suburbs in Oxford, you know, in a kind of relatively unexceptional area of the world. You know, luckily yeah. we had pretty, it was pretty privileged. But I really, really connected with films. Like they made me complete. They blew every film I watched pretty much, even if it wasn't the greatest film, it blew my mind. Like it had yeah. a complete. Even though I remember seeing like Robocop at a ridiculously like, early age, like an inappropriate age, age like nine <laughs> or ten or something like that. And I walked around like Robocop for about a week, doing yeah. all the moves and everything. You know, like that. And that's the most ridiculous, superficial level. But then when I saw films that really made challenged my view of the world or made me think about things in a different way, that that re- I, and I felt like well. It can't just be me, right? It really, yeah, yeah. Every single person who ever watches a, a film, it yeah, it helps if you see it on a big screen and it helps if you see it in the right frame of mind and, and all that sure. sort of thing. But it's, yeah, they really, at their best, they can really completely change the way you see things. Yep. So how does how does that, your love of filmmaking, translate f- to you recording your mates in um, London? How does, in your in university, how does that work? Look, we've, got, just we've, a... got a, we've got visitors. Hang on, I'm going to, uh, this, is, this is my family. One second. Got two, hey, two guys. guys. You, do you guys like films? Yeah, what's your favorite film right now? If you had to choose one. Uh, the oh, which one? The gerbils. The gerbils. Oh, no, that's the one you made. We've been making films. <laughs> we made one about two naughty gerbils, magic gerbils. What's the, if you could choose one film, the only film you're allowed to keep, and we're going to have to throw all the rest into the river, which one oh, would it be? no. <laughs> the gerbils your own film <laughs> it's a masterpiece man it's, it's, it's a masterpiece what about you would it be a studio ghibli one or would it be we're gonna watch oliver the musical tonight. Oliver. oliver well you haven't seen it yet you don't yeah. the rubbish. <laughs> come on right go 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 you start eating without me don't worry don't worry i'm having a chat <laughs> i'm talking okay you can listen to me all right so <laughs> you gonna the, 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 they're cute they're adorable uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, they're on good form. So uh, it's it's been nice for them having us around a lot. You know, I'm, yeah. I, we both try and be around as much as we can, but you end up inevitably shortchanging them a bit. But I've been working. We're trying to work upstairs. Yeah. Set up an edit suite. That's enough, guys. Guys, guys, go outside. So, um, <laughs> uh, so the question was. So I was asking how um how did you translate that love of filmmaking to just randomly starting recording your mates? Yes, in... well, no, so, so, yeah, well, with, with this, so with, with the band, I mean, I, we were at UCL, it was the first, yeah. within, I think, hours of me arriving in halls, so we had these halls, like student halls that we yeah. uh, stayed at, um, and for me, for us, it was Ramsey Hall, which is just around the corner from Tottenham Road, like, it's the slap bang in the centre, it's the best yeah. place you could be on the planet for us at that time, and so we, so I arrived, and, you know, we're doing the usual thing of, my dad was helping me get stuff out the back of the car, and I think I bumped into probably... I think Chris was the first person I bumped into and then maybe Will and Johnny 
quite soon afterwards on the sun, on the same day. And I think we yeah. all had dinner again. I think maybe that night we all ate together and we were just hung out a bit. And everyone, everyone sat outside and it was probably, it would have been September, so it's probably still quite yeah. sunny. So I just remember, you know, and we and amongst another twenty people I met that day, but it was it was nice. Like we all got on. And you never, you never thought meeting Chris or Will or Johnny that these would these guys would turn into what they are. They were, they were just normal dudes that you met and you had dinner with, and they were just friends, right? Like nothing gave it away. Yes and no. In the same way that we were saying, you know, talking about me wanting to work in film, it's like well, half of your brain says. Yeah, you're going to go out and you're going to take over the world and you can do anything. Yeah. And, you know, the same thing. I, my parents were, uh, you know, are amazing and they were like, you can do whatever you want to do. You, you, know, you can achieve it. You know, don't don't set your sights too low. Um, on the other hand, they're like, yeah, but filmmaking is crazy and you'll never make it. So you're going to have those two parts <laughs> of your brain. So I think I have that thing of like, yeah, of course, I'm going to go out and make films. And the other half you're going, yeah, that'll probably never work out. Yeah. And you'll end up getting a job you hate. So I think they had a similar thing with them. It's like, as soon as they started, I mean, Chris was the first person I really heard playing music and around, you know, he would, he was a very, and he still is quite an extreme character in a really good way. Like he's, when I met him within about seconds, I thought this guy is nuts, but I really <laughs> love him. Like he's really, he had, he had crazy curly hair, really yeah. big, long like mine. We both yeah. had very long hair at that time. And we would, um, he came, he'd just come up to you and immediately like, want to know everything about your entire life. It was very intense. And, uh, and I remember only a few weeks later, and he hasn't really changed that much, but I was walking to, to I think, to uni, and I was walking down one of the corridors going to a lecture. And yeah. he came up, the, we had these communal toilets, which even had like a kind of a partition where they had a bath. And you could kind of, you know, so you could be in one cubicle in the bath, or you could be in another bit with the showers or whatever. Yeah. And he came and grabbed me. We had a, he had his guitar strapped to him. He's like, come, 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 come. Sit down, sit down. So you're going to sat me in one end of a bathtub, empty bathtub. And I, he sat <laughs> the other. And he was, because he was listening, I guess the acoustic, but also it was somewhere private. And he sat and played this tune. It's an amazing tune I've never heard before or since. And he played the whole thing and it was really quiet at the end. And I said, That's, he said, what do you think? And I was like, it's, it's amazing. Like, honestly, yeah. it's the most beautiful thing I've ever heard in my life. And he's like, ah, shit, shit. <laughs> you, oh, oh, it's terrible. I, I've got no talent. I've got, and even though there's a kind of slightly different, slightly more tongue-in-cheek version of that he does now, I think he still retains that, which is probably I, why they're as incredible as they as they are. I, I, He was always, always like that. I mean, I get it. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of feel like I have it similarly with things that I work on. I can see all the faults. I can't see any of the positives, all that sort of yeah. thing. And that, that's why it's very reassuring, you know, like to, to have the chat we're having or even just when you turn up at a, a you know, like a film screening or something like that, and people react. You can go, OK, fine. Well, they get the gist of it. Like it's not, you know, yeah, OK, maybe it's rough around the edges or maybe we didn't, you know, on a documentary, we didn't get the interview we wanted or yeah. maybe we didn't have the money to get the archive or whatever it might be. You know, or on, on a, when we're doing film shoots, drama shoots with actors, yeah, maybe yeah. maybe the actor couldn't find it in that moment, but you got enough or maybe the camera broke and you missed the one shot, but no one else will ever know. So there's all that kind of side of things. I get that. I just remember, I mean, it's something, I don't know how it is with Canada and the U.S., but if England and the U and the US have this funny relationship where yeah we tend to kind of see ourselves in the shadow of the US for obvious reasons yeah. and I think people over here on the one hand they have this kind of humility that or they have which is sometimes can be fake you know and I think sometimes it's like there's almost like in search of a compliment you sit there go oh well do you really like it do you oh I'm not sure about it and so you're waiting for the other best so it can be just as fake as someone who's over the top and, and but the cliche about the US is it's all kind of bigger is better People yeah. are arrogant and so on. And I remember um, uh, Chris was talking about this one time with uh, with Tim. Like one of his best friends is a guy called Tim, one of our, all of our best friends, Tim Crompton. Yeah. We often 
uh, when they're working on music, he'll send, he will try and, you know, get feedback. Tim's a great musician. So he will send stuff to Tim and Tim's like the extreme example of that. Like he's so, he's a brilliant musician, but he, and you should set his, he's uh, got a band called the high wire who are phenomenal, but he ha- doesn't have whatever that star gene is. Like yeah. He doesn't have, I don't have, I don't have that kind of, I don't feel comfortable when a lot of people are staring at me and some people love it. You know, you see yeah. it in certain actors, certain kinds of, and it is kind of a pretty key part of being wanting to be a, a at least a famous pop star. You know, not everyone has that, but I think you know you could sure. be a musician and not have it, but but a lot of them do have it. And Chris definitely has it. Like he'd be very honest about it. But I remember they went to you know how that the kind of crazy thing that happens once you start re- reaching a certain level of fame, where you know the Pope will ring up or Bono <laughs> will ring up or someone you know God will ring up and say, listen, do you want to come and chill for a bit? You want to come and whatever it might be. Yeah. They got that call from uh, I think they just finished maybe the second album or they were in the process of finishing the second album and chris got a call from from kanye's people saying oh do you want you know he's in london he's in the studio do you want to come and hang out he was like oh i can't go hang out with kanye west what am i going to say to him i can't and tim, <laughs> tim was like go like go along you know you go and say hi to him you know you love his music why don't you just go and say hi to him so he was so they kind of reluctantly he was like yeah okay fine so you got to come with me so you had Chris and then Tim, who's like the sweetest but shyest, most humble person on the planet. Yeah. And they got there and I think I guess they just had a chat and Kanye maybe played them some tunes or something. And then at the end of it, for, you know, Kanye was like, so how did you get into music? The same question you can ask me about film. And Chris was like, wow, you know, I don't, I don't even know if I can really consider myself a musician, man. I don't know. What I play? Is it really music? I don't know. I don't, oh, my what God. What about you? You know, the usual thing that, that he would say, particularly back then, I think he'd do it, yeah. he'd be less, it wouldn't be so intense now. And then Kanye was like, well, you know, I mean, from an early age, I was considered a musical genius. And, you know, and <laughs> That's like, so on character with Kanye. That's so on character. Then they came out afterwards, you know, they, they got on well. And then on the way out, I remember that Tim was kind of going, whoa, did he, you know, all that stuff about him being a genius, man, really? And, uh, and Chris was like, yeah, but, you know, I we're, we're, what the way that we approach life and music and art is not right either. Like maybe there's maybe he's too extreme one way, maybe we're too extreme the other way. It's got to be a happy yeah. medium where you can accept a compliment. Where if someone's into, I always like the way that Tarantino talked about his films. Like he loves watching his films. He's pretty untortured about them. He likes them, otherwise he wouldn't make them. Yeah. You know, and then other people like them. He's like, oh, thanks. Yeah, exactly. And he's kind of, he makes what he wants to make. He gets given the kind of space to try it out and make it. Yeah. He spends a lot of time over them. So they are what he wants, like for better or worse, whether you love them or hate them, that is what he meant to say. Yeah. And so if other people are into it, then he's kind of like, that's great. Whereas I think over here, there's a danger also that you sometimes, I mean, I'm getting better at this as well, but is that someone, you almost go the wrong way. Someone says, hey man, I really, really liked something you did. And you're like, oh, you're really full of shit. You know what we're talking about? <laughs> like, no, that's not the right answer either. You know? No, no. If someone likes something you did, then, yeah. then that's accept the compliment. It's okay. I mean, you have it here even with appearance. Someone's like, you know, uh, someone was talking about this in relation to uh, like a whole, you know, generations of women have been uh, talk- talking about their own appearance. Yeah. It's something, uh, certainly in Britain, I don't know in other countries, but for a long time, I think hopefully it's changing now that, you know, you say to someone, oh, I like your hair. Even if they just come out of the hair salon, they'll be like, oh, this, I just cut it myself. Oh, you know, really? Mm, yeah. you, know. you couldn't accept a compliment. You'd have to kind yeah. of somehow downsize it and i think yeah so anyway so it's, it's a similar i get where he comes from yeah so we can see that you're like okay yeah you were friends with coldplay so that kind of makes sense that you directed their movie but i just want to talk about how you got into directing oasis supersonic like how did that happen that one because i i was mostly doing dramas like the, i kind of fell into i've been i have done a few documentaries now but really my intention was always to do dramas um and then, but I had done a few and I'd done some, I'd, I'd directed with another uh, director called Michael Winterbottom. So we did two films together. Yeah. And I'd done uh, some other films. So just, just to, I wanted to know just real quick. Um, so I was reading, I was going through your, I was doing some careless internet researching and I saw that I was going through your IMDb page. And did you, you were also the part of uh, A Mighty Heart, right? No. So, so Mighty Heart, I worked on Mighty Heart with, with but only uh, helping him with the archive just for a few weeks. But I, so I, well, I was very lucky. So Michael, one of my favorite film directors growing up. Yeah. And um, 
In fact, actually, I just didn't realize in the back, back, look, here we go. Well, one of the memorabilia, I did not work on this film, I want you, but I loved it when I saw it and it, I, and he was throwing it out of the office when I started working there, so I kept it. See, um, that's so beautiful. Go, so, that's good, right? So the, yeah. um, so I, I always loved his films and I'd always try, I've tried on various occasions to meet him and I'd never got the chance that was a Q&A he was supposed to turn up at. He did when I was working at a local cinema. Then another time he was supposed to be doing Q&A after one of my favorite films of his called Wonderland, which was on the film festival. And I was there as a, I worked as a, like a student film critic. And yeah. so he did, again, he didn't turn up. And then I heard this job through a friend of a friend. I heard this job was going as a, as working as an assistant at his, his office. So I put myself forward and I didn't get the job. Um, but then the guy who got it apparently was so useless or he like he loped like day two he like disappeared and got married oh or something God. happened. And they rang me and I was on holiday I was like alright screw it I'll get on the next plane I came back and so I met him really and worked as his assistant and as a, as a runner for, for a year and what's so lovely about him and his producer Andrew uh, at the time was that they had a company together it was very small it was the way that I tend to work as well it was like five six people and but it, it means that there's loads of great opportunities. So immediately he was like, oh, well, what else can you do? Yeah, okay, fine. You, you're making tea at the moment, but you know, <laughs> can you shoot? Can you cut? Can you write? Can you, and I was like, yeah, yeah, I can do everything. I know, you know, I'm going to be a director like you. He's like, okay, fine. So he, he was obviously stored it somewhere in his memory banks. Yeah. And then further down the line, I ended up shooting on one of his films and I ended up editing on another one. And, and then I had this thought one night, he was... Um, supposed to be doing uh he was supposed to be doing a film he was doing a film called goal a uh, football film because him and andrew were doing f- football mad yeah he didn't make yeah. it in the end he walked off it um because the he didn't get on with the producers and i'm not into sport particularly i'm not a super yeah, I'm, yeah I'm, there's not it's not really i don't have that gene in me I'm yeah. probably uniquely in the uk everyone else is football mad but, I, but i'm not interested yeah so, and i was supposed to be editing on it and so i was like Look, you should I'd read about these guys who were known as the Tipton Three. They'd been released from Guantanamo a few weeks previously. And I said, well, no, you should be making this film. Like if someone, I was like, if someone could let me make a film, I would make a film about these guys. It's like it's yeah. everything that's going on at the moment, everything from 9-11 to Afghanistan to what's about to happen in Iraq. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the film that should be made. And, uh, and he was like, well, look, if you're so passionate about it, you should make it. I was like, well, I'll, I'd make it. If you want to give me like a million pounds, I'll go, yeah, yeah. I'll make it. And he's like, all right, well, he said, okay, we'll, make, we'll shoot it together. Go and see, contact the lawyers, see if you can convince yeah. them, and then we'll, we'll make it together. Which for me, I mean, particularly back then, when I, you know, my background was, you know, I'd, met, I'd shot basically nothing. I'd shot like a few short films, and I'd worked yeah. as his assistant and various different things. I, I thought he was going to go, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like the equivalent of Spielberg ringing me up and saying, oh, listen, do you want to, come and hang out and shoot Jurassic <laughs> World 17 you know like, like it's not gonna happen but yeah he, um, but he was so and he stuck to his guns and so we and we ended up making a couple of films together um but no a mighty heart he made after that and I was in between doing I was trying to get a film finance at the time and he said look you want to come in and just source all the archive they had like a section that opens the film there that was really the first kind of three or four minutes of the film and he just wanted me to get in loads of footage all the best footage about the war on terror, what happened off the 9-11 and so on. So that was... I, that I was, only asked because... Really yeah, I only asked because A Mighty Heart was shot in our neighborhood in Karachi. And I remember very, very vividly that we heard, like when I was coming back from school and we heard that, you know, the Hollywood people are here. And like they had sh- they had shut off like a cordon of the street. And I think Angelina Jolie was there and, and a lot of other people were there. And then I, as I was... Re- I, uh, that, that stuck with me in my memory. And as I was reading IMDb, it said Matt Whitecross, A Mighty Heart. I was like, no way. If he had come to Karachi, that would have been a, such a weird little thing. Like, you had come to Karachi, and then we were there, and then now all these years, we're kind of, like, on on Skype talking. Well, I have been to Karachi a few times, because we, um, so we... So I worked with Michael. Michael did a film before that called In This World. And yeah. we shot traveling from, uh, well, from the corner of the edge of Afghanistan through then Peshawar all the way down through Pakistan and then yeah. ended up going through Iran and, and all the tracing this refugee's journey. And then yeah. on road to Guantanamo, we shot some of it in Pakistan, then up in Afghanistan and then in Iran. Um, yeah. Iran partly doubling for Afghanistan and Cuba. And then, yeah. uh, and then I went back a couple of times and now I go to, I haven't been back to Pakistan for a few years, but Iran we go to every year. So it's, um, yeah. yeah, it's an area That's amazing. I know better than England. 
fun in me. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I don't, so cool. I, you know, I know about four cities in in England, but I've travelled all around Pakistan and Iran and Afghanistan. That's crazy. Yeah, that, that is amazing. That I don't think a lot of us yeah. knew that. That's awesome. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, I always imagined because of my par- parents' background, all the films I wanted to do were very political and all quite yeah. heavy and serious. And I never really imagined I'd I'd be doing music, but I love music. So I yeah. kind of I've I've fallen into it. And I'm not exclusive to everything else. Like the last few things I've done have not been to do with music, but yeah. I I love it. I just I think with what I, I admire people like Michael or Soderberg or Greengrass yeah. or these kind of or like all the directors from the forties and fifties who would try lots of different things and I, I uh, not sticking to one thing. So like the we're doing a, a sports documentary at the moment and yeah. I did a uh, one about the Bauhaus movement just before that and then hopefully the next thing might be uh, I don't know uh, probably a drama as well so so we'll see but I well, the documentaries the great thing about it aside from loving it is that um, when it's mostly archival I've been able to have a pretty good family life and yeah. it's hard when you're doing a drama you know you're, you're probably somewhere else on the planet yeah. getting up every night yeah. every morning at five coming home at one it doesn't leave yeah, I've Yeah, I had a, I made a, I did a shot a TV series called Fleming about the life of the Bond writer Ian Fleming in Hungary. Yeah. And it was when, but this was pre-kids, and remember when me and my wife were talking about maybe having a family. And I disappeared, you know, I got the call on the Monday, went in for the meeting, and the Friday I was in Hungary. Oh, wow. I didn't really come back for six months, you know. And she came, wow. I mean, she's a doctor, she came to visit me every single weekend in Hungary. Wow. And she, yeah, which is pretty crazy. And, and, uh, and it was just like, okay, this isn't... And I remember the producer is married to a very famous uh, film director herself. And she was like, his one... She kind of said it. I was like, look at me. She's like, the one regret he had was he missed out on his kid growing up. Yeah. And he had an amazing career. And so I, so I was like, yeah. And it just... When I was supposed to be doing a big TV series, um, Supersonic kind of landed on my lap. Yeah. But just through a friend of a friend. I, I know uh, there's a great filmmaker called Asif Kapadia. And... Yeah. I think his, yeah, who did Amy and, uh, and did Senna and Maradona. Yeah. And he was supposed to be, I think they he had been approached to do the, this film, uh, do Supersonic, but he was in the middle of doing Amy. Amy was, you know, I think he enters each project thinking it'll only last a year or two. And it would, like, Amy had lasted like five years. I think wow. Senna lasted like six years or something. And so he's like, no, I'm not going to step off into another, another music project. And I and so they rang me and I and I'd known the other producers as well. We'd had been talking about doing a Joe Strummer film. So I and I liked the idea of it, but I was like, look, it's never gonna happen, let's be honest. The the brothers hate each other. They'll never <laughs> yeah. they'll never if one says yes, the other says no. But maybe yeah. I get to meet them. You know, maybe I get to meet them. i like, that would be a childhood dream. So I was like, okay, Were you I, fans, I, I, though? Yeah, I love their music and I'd seen them a few times. I mean you couldn't in this country you couldn't really grow up and not well, at least you have to, they'd have to be on your radar. You have to love or hate them. And I love them. Yeah. Uh, but I, but you know, I didn't, I don't have like any Oasis tattoos or anything. Like I wasn't a fanatic, <laughs> but I love their music. You know, they're, I think they're a big band for me growing up. And um, it was funny because the, when we were going through all the tapes for the Coldplay film, one of the assistants pulled out, she's like, have you seen this? And it was me in the mirror in Chris and uh, Johnny's flat for some reason, jumping up and down filming myself singing along to rock and roll <laughs> 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 which, was, which was very embarrassing i was like wow i guess i was a fan so um, that should have been uh, on the dvd extras <laughs> yeah definitely not but the uh but it was a yeah so so i was a huge fan of those and i thought look if i get to shake noel gallagher's hand or liam's hand that that'll be fun but then i uh, went uh, into i have and they were like, i have a horrible i have a horrible noel gallagher story i just want to segue into that he uh a couple of years ago noel came with the high flying birds to toronto and that's when, like, I had just seen Supersonic for the first time. I was, a, like, everybody's a Wonder Wall and Don't Look Back an Anger fan. But, like, I wasn't really an Oasis fan until I saw um, Supersonic on Netflix. And I saw the whole thing. And by the end of it, I was literally, like, I am in love with these two assholes. Like, I cannot. There's no other way to put it. And so I literally, like, listened to uh, Definitely Maybe and What's the Story Morning Glory up until Be Here Now. And I was completely in love. And then I found no old solo stuff. And I was like, this is brilliant, amazing. So on, on, on Spotify, they tell you when, when they're coming on tour, right? 
So it said that Ono is coming in a couple of months, and I was like, that's it. I'm getting it. I'm going to buy the ticket. I'm going to be there. So, anyways, I get scammed on the ticket. I lose $80. Don't get the ticket. The show sold out. So I'm like, okay, that's not a problem. I've seen on Instagram that he comes, uh, he, you know, before the show, he comes out, signs stuff, you know. I can go and meet him. I can say hi. Maybe give him a poetry book. Show it. Show him that, you know, that his music inspired my art. So now it's negative 10 degrees. Me and my brother, who's not even a fan yet, right? I don't even know that. To be honest, that much. He doesn't even. He doesn't even care. He's just there to support me. So we're standing in the cold for like five hours. It sounds like an Eminem song now, but like we're standing there for five hours. Noah comes out after five hours and he's chill and every there's like about a hundred people there and they're signing. He's signing stuff and all. And so I had I had just bought um, from my paycheck I had bought um, his newest album on vinyl and I had bought what's the story Morning Glory on vinyl. So I was like I'm gonna get these two signed. So he's he's in front of me and the security guards are in front of us. And so I gave him one vinyl. I I take one vinyl right. And I'm like, you know what? He gives it back to me. He's like, how about you take both of them? You'll get more time with them that way. I'm like, that's great. That's great. So he goes up. He takes a picture with Noel. I come around back in my place in line and the security guard kicks me out. <laughs> and he's like, "You, I saw you cut. You're not in line. And like, there was a whole commotion. There was about like 20 people left. And the security guard was literally threatening. Like, if you don't leave, I will put Noel back in, in the building. And I'm trying to wave the vinyl at Noel, like, just sign my vinyl. And Noel's, like, trying to come, but he's, like, a bit apprehensive because there's, like, security guards. And at the end, the guard just pushed Noel into the building and the signing stopped. I've never seen him more sad. <laughs> it, it crushed my heart so much, man. I can't even tell you when, where to begin. I was, like, and my parents were in Pakistan. I was home alone, came home. I listened to Stop Crying Your Heart <laughs> for, like... An hour. It was devastating. I couldn't listen to an Oasis song for like three weeks after that. That's horrible. Yeah, yeah that's, that's security. Yeah, security is difficult, isn't it? Because it's a hard yeah. job to do, and you've got a lot of responsibility. It is hard, but there are a lot of pr pricks out there. Um, I'm I'm happy for you to at least that you at least got that moment. Like even if you were like, if this doesn't come through, I'll at least get to get sh shake Noel's hand, and I envy you. That's all I'm gonna say. No, no, look, I mean, he, and he was amazing. I think that's the other thing. It's like often you have that thing of don't meet your heroes. Whatever yeah. They, they turn out to be assholes. And, but him and him and Liam were exactly what I hoped they would be. I read somewhere that you had about 20 hours of 20 hours of footage with each brother or something like that. Like 20 hours of interview hours. Yeah. That's so amazing. That's insane. Like, as long as, yeah, as long as you want us to keep coming back, we'll keep coming back. And even when we finished... Uh, we we kind of left the, with the door open to to them coming back. And no, was like, any time you want us to come back. And as soon as we, uh, you know, I said, look, this is the last one, really, Liam. We got to the end. He was like, no, 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 I'm gonna come back next week. Let's play. Like, we'll move on to the third album. Come on. He's very, <laughs> they're very sweet. He said, it's this is therapeutic. He's like, this is the therapy I've never had. You know, so I was, so they're very, very good. I mean, that's like, it's it's unheard of for people to give you that kind of time what did you what did you learn when you sat with them for so long what did you learn that other people other fans would not have known between the two like their chemistry and all that what did you see it's a good question because it's kind of uh, you know i mean I suppose in every documentary there's that thing that's going to citizen kane rosebud thing of like what is it that makes yeah. someone tick and even they don't know that obviously you know it's, you end up in the space of 90 minutes or two hours you having to make uh, a relatively simple version of their lives a communicable version of their lives and you try and make it as truthful as you can but it's very hard i mean how, you know someone's life isn't you can't really get to the nub of it in two hours but you can try and approximate it as best as you can so it's kind of, it's a version of the truth it's my version of the story but they're infinitely complex people so in terms of what i learned I suppose, I mean, what's, what did surprise me that hopefully we communicated in the film is that it's, you know, there's all this anger between them still to this day. Maybe it's worse than it's been before. It was yeah. not great when we met initially, but it was still, you know, they'd, they'd bumped into each other at some event or something. And it was like, it wasn't as hostile as it had been. And yeah. um, I think it's one of the, one of the things about social media is it just, everything escalates, it, you know, and if you, they should should have a kind of cooling off period or something. Every time Liam tweets something about Noel, they should be like, you no. sure? You really you definitely want to go there? Because I think that's the problem is, you know, maybe pre-Twitter, et cetera, that this, none of this would have, you know, eventually would have calmed down. But um, yeah. but yeah, so basically, I think for a session with each of them, we'd, we'd managed to get quite a bit of uh, archive already. And so 
I started off by kind of asking him a few questions. And then after we'd spent about an hour doing that, I was like, okay, can I just show you some stuff? Not in any particular order. I just want to show you some things we've been finding and see if it triggers any memories. And I yeah. showed them a few clips, some, some of which I, you know, no one else had, had seen. I was like, what about this? What about this? And I, was, I saw that both, in both of them, they seemed to kind of, they melted a bit. Not in, yeah. uh, this wasn't like a set, this wasn't like an Oprah Winfrey show moment and then like that. Yeah. You just see, hang on, because they go in with a certain version of events and a certain uh, attitude to the other. And I think yeah. turning turn the clock back 20 years and going, do you remember this? This is how it was at the beginning. And being able to, and, and there was no filter. It was like, look, this is you back then in, with, with each other. And so I think they both seem to kind of like, oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, shit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. There's, and then, from that point on, both of them were incredibly generous and warm to, to you know, they, they have that kind of amazing ability to, to kind of, see, which I guess brothers do, siblings do, that they, can, they see each other's flaws, but they also see each other's, the positive side of, of each other's characters. And so I, yeah. there was that moment, was like, I was very surprised by that. And the, and the trick for us, I think, in terms of the editing was like, we have so much material now, we could make 10 hundred different, you know, 1,000 different um, uh, films. And I could... We could do one version which is very sensationalist. They were very funny and very horrible about each other at certain points. So we could just use that, that material. That's one yeah. version. You can do another version which is very soft and where they just say nice stuff about each other. They also said all that stuff. And then there's hopefully yeah. there's some kind of happy medium. And that's what we try to do is like acknowledge the love, acknowledge the hatred, <laughs> acknowledge the good times and the bad times. And, you know, trying to find a balance within two hours. But they didn't give us any kind of steer on that they weren't like oh he, you know you can't say that or don't use this or whatever yeah. they were they were good again they kind of stepped away from the creative process like that uh actually wanted to ask like how did you like so you, when you were trying to get these, ex these excerpts from them did you have to like schedule them at different times so they don't clash like how do you kind of work with that yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we tended to do one week one brother one week one week the other but um yeah we had there were no dangerous moments in that sense. It was more just to do with when we were bringing in other bandmates and so on. It was like, well, you know, do we want to, do we want Liam in with Bonehead or Noel in with, but you know, it was that sort of thing. It was like kind of yeah. thinking with Mark Coyle, their producer, um, yeah. would it be good for him to sit with someone else? But actually we ended up doing everything solo apart from one session with Liam and Bonehead, which was actually, I think we, they just overlapped. And you suddenly realize yeah. that actually there's, you know, there's so many interviews with Noel and Liam in the past together. And one of them tends to shut up and the other one, or it tends to be quite superficial. So I, I should think in some ways for us, the fact that we couldn't interview them together was, was better. I think we would have cho probably chosen to do that if we had, you know, had the choice anyway. And we didn't have the choice. And then I kept on thinking along the, along the way, well, maybe, you know, they've been so nice about each other. Maybe, maybe gradually things will calm down and then i think just after we finished the thing whole thing escalated again and it got worse from do you think they'll ever come back do you think oasis will ever come back i i don't know i can't i i don't see why they would to be honest because i know liam would love to do it but i, I don't see what noel stands to gain from it i think it's like yeah. i i love them both but i wouldn't want to be in, in a band with them <laughs> so, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that i would want to so post Oasis, sorry. So post Oasis, whose whose uh, solo career do you follow? Like whose solo music do you like better? I know it's it's hard to choose, but I'm gonna put you on the spot. Yeah, well, I'm, no, I'm glad I don't have to choose. I mean, they they've been very nice to us, and they invite us to all the gigs they do whenever they're in love. Well, yeah. anyway, and um, so I've been seeing them both. I I, I love them. I mean, they're very they have different. I guess they're probably different fan bases to a degree. Uh, yeah. But I don't know. I, I, I kind of we saw Noel in uh, the Albert Hall, which was amazing, yeah. like an amazing yeah. gig where he did a kind of acoustic gig in the first half, which was uh, Oasis stuff. And then the uh, second half was all his solo stuff, which was yeah. incredible. We saw Liam at Ali Pali, uh, which is just a concert hall around the corner from my house. Yeah. Uh, and, and many other times, you know, they've been... No, I'm glad I don't have to... I mean, look, I... There's something amazing about seeing the two together, which is irreplaceable. But I, I like the fact that they have these solo careers. I get, you know, we get different kinds of music. I don't know. I mean, bands do come back together, but I don't know that it generally tends to be. It's not. It doesn't tend to be like the creative height of anyone's lives. You know, they tend to do yeah. it as some kind of nostalgic thing. Yeah. I was lucky enough to see Oasis back then when they were, you know, they when they were still a band and they were still together. Uh -huh. I don't know. I, I, 
the idea of them coming back together. I remember Noel talking about it. He was saying, look, a lot of these bands who who are doing it now, it's like, like it's fine. I get it. You do it for financial reasons or maybe you do it for because you never got a chance to hit that moment, that peak. You know, the Stone Roses fell apart or they were kind of pulled apart for yeah. a lot of different reasons. And they never got to, to, to do a Nebworth. Well, now they get to do it. You know, they, now they get well, they got that moment where they, they were kind of appreciated at the scale they should have been. But, and the same with the Sex Pistols and a lot of other bands. But Oasis did it. Like, you can't be any bigger than Nebworth. You know? Yeah. What do you, you do? Can't. He was like, what do you do? Put it on for like 10 nights instead. Or <laughs> it's like, it's like, we did it. So then what are you doing it for? It can only really be for the money or for some kind of nostalgic thing, which is not yeah. not really the, the reason to do anything. Yeah, okay, of course, there's plenty of people who weren't born back then who want to see them. But they would really be seeing Oasis. Yeah. What's the story? Morning Glory came out a year before I was born. I was born in 96. He was born in 98. He, didn't even, he wasn't even born for beer now. So, like, we've never seen Oasis live like that. It would have been nice for, like, the younger generation that sort of caught on with their music after Supersonic. But I don't know. I guess I actually had no idea know. how big of a phenomenon the Oasis were until I watched the documentary. So, um, yeah. Because for us, we would have never known. Yeah, they never made it in the States or Canada. I mean, like, they were obviously they made it to a degree, but they never became, you know, they weren't like, uh, I don't know, even like Radiohead or whatever. They never could have reached yeah. that huge, huge, huge peak. But I, or Coldplay or whatever. But I, you know, there's something kind of nice about that. Like, they had it in the palm of their hands and, and they blew it. That was kind of glorious as well. One of my favorite, one of my favorite scene, like uh, stories from Supersonic, is when Noel talks about Talk Tonight. I think that is yeah. wonderful. One of the most beautiful representations of, of just what a songwriter can do. Like he doesn't even remember the girl who he that inspired the song, but yet it's one of my favorite Oasis songs. Oh, uh, good. Yeah. No, it was one of the first things that I cut. I remember that, and it was much, much longer the original thing because he. He started talking about it, and then Mark Coyle, his friend, yeah. producer, started talking about it, and he was saying he he said he was he's got quite a psychedelic turn of phrase, and he was like it was alien abduction, it was alien <laughs> abduction. Like Noel went off in the desert, and he came back, and it wasn't the same guy. And yeah. it was like, there's something really, and I cut together, I kind of did like a South Park type animation all over it, and we used it. It was really it was good. Yeah, but, you know, then it was just too much of a good thing, but but it's uh, yeah, it was one of my favorite. favorite ones. So what 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 are your if I were to put you on the spot off the top of the head, what are your top five Oasis songs? Well, I love uh, yeah, I love Talk Tonight. I really yeah. love love Slide Away, which we didn't we it was in the film for a very very long time, and it's yeah. uh, like if not my favorite, then it's one of my yeah definitely one of my top five. But yeah. it, it kept them. So the 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 rule we had was that every song had to mean something. Yeah. Like you can't just put it in because it was a song that they had. So for example, talk tonight is obviously has has a has a purpose. And then yeah. Um. Then the question was, I remember Asif, who was one of the producers, and uh, and James, who's uh, one of the other producers. They would come in. So they weren't involved in the day to day, but they would come in every so often for a screening. Yeah. And at one point, we didn't have any Supernova or Wonderwall or one other big track. They went in the film and, and he was like, are you crazy? Like, these are your big, those are your, like, your show-stopping jazz. Like, I know, but they don't really fit. Like, I'm not going to have a sequence where he goes, oh, and then, and then we start singing Wonderwall. It's like, it needs to mean something. Yeah. And then we kind of found a way of going, okay, well, it was Wonderwall that they kind of took them to the next level so we can show how they rise through that song. I love that montage of Noel going from ev- all of those cuts when he starts from one place and then you cut off these, all these different performances from him in Canada, US, UK, Top of the Pops, everything. That's such a cool shot from start to finish of Wonderwall. The, gra- the gradual progression of it, it's, it's amazing. Thank you. Well, well, no, that was, yeah, so that was fun to do. So then it kind of had a meaning. We're like, oh, yeah, same, Don't Look Back in Anger wasn't in for a long time. And it was like, oh. well, how can, it, how can it not be in? And everyone's like, well, look, if you're not going to put it in the actual film, then it has to be in credits music. But I was, yeah. I was always adamant that it had to be Master Plan because I was like, Master Plan is, is the ultimate perfect yeah. final song. Like, that's the greatest. End. That is the greatest Oasis song. Definitely. I think so. So, so, then, so then it was like, okay, so, and then the same thing with uh, Champagne Supernova. And then it was like, okay, well, then that will be the one that we do in Nebworth. And then that makes sense. But it was difficult. And Slide Away was in the film up until like a week before we locked the film and then it was like oh no we've got to take it something's got to go so we cut it out but um yeah i would say so okay maybe i'm not very good at lists but if it's master plan and slide away and talk tonight 
yeah. then it's got to be that aim in it. It has to be the Aquies. So that's uh-huh. cool. And then I guess it's uh, probably Champagne Supernova, and I'm sure I've missed out another 10 that I love. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, bless you. Bless you. So, um, yeah, I would say. What about you guys? That's a good list. Um, for me, it has to be Master Plan, uh, Don't Look Back in Anger, uh, Talk Tonight. Um, you know what? I really like Lila. I don't think Lila gets the love that it deserves. Lila is amazing. It's a really good one. Yeah, there's later ones, which are great. We actually had a couple of later ones in there. Yeah. Um, you know, even though they were they were kind of uh, anachronistic, I, I kind of I like the idea of having them earlier. But anyway, then we cut those sequences. And, and if you're kind of like uh, so, when I'm uh, like when I'm hearing you, I feel like you keep going back and forth between like cutting songs, adding songs. Um, how much creative freedom did you feel that like you had while you were making this documentary? We had complete creative freedom, which is which is crazy, really. Given given that it was their project, really, it was Noel's idea that he brought to uh to his friend simon who used to design the front covers who's a producer yeah and then simon took to asif and james and then asif and james and simon all brought to us to me and fiona my producer so it was um so yeah I, again that was another question i had is i like, look i love the idea of doing this but if it's gonna have someone if i'm gonna have someone tapping me on the shoulder and saying oh you can't use that you can't do this and they're like no no look, they're very relaxed don't worry about it and they were and they, it was exactly like that I didn't have any comments like they had we were, we had to show um, film to each brother. They could watch. So could, this was the contract, right? Like a legal contract. We could. We had to show them the film, or we had the right to show them the film three times each, um, and they would could give us notes. And we, yeah. had, we didn't have to agree on the notes, but they we had they they had the ability to give us notes. And so we they watched it twice each. First time yeah. it was like, oh, it's got a lot to take in. And the notes yeah. were really good. The notes were really like. Well, the first question was like, what did the other one make of it? And I was like, oh, we can tell them a bit. And then the other thing was like, yeah, the notes were kind of, you know, uh, was talking more about, like, he was like, look, one thing he said was, uh, you know, we, he gave us the ability to talk to any of his friends or collaborators. So it was like, you want to talk to Johnny Depp? Because he spent some time, they were writing, there was a whole section on the third album, the writing of the third album. You want to talk to Johnny Depp? Great. So we had the, the thing all lined up and then I was like I don't think it's going to be in the film and I would like even though it would be a childhood dream of mine to yeah. hang out with Johnny Depp yeah. I don't want to waste his time like yeah. it's, not, it's not going to be in the film we spent uh, a long time talking to Johnny Marr for example who was a it was well, obviously aside from being one of the greatest musicians of all time yeah. was a mentor of sorts to to Noel and yeah. an influence anyway and then ended up and he, there's a very funny anecdote about how he gave his guitar to Noel and all of this stuff yeah. was in the film at some point but again, we didn't. And at a certain point, I was like, "Well, I don't really. I don't want to lose it, but we're gonna lose something. Like yeah. we're out three hours." Like Hemingway said, "Yeah, you got you got to kill your darling." So that that's that's, the, that's right. The, the Noel's thing was like, "Why haven't you not put any of the people these these people talking about the importance of the band?" And I was like, "Well, if yeah. you watched the the film for two hours and you don't understand that it was an important band, I don't think having another person like a famous." talking head telling you that they were important is going to That's change true. your mind i think yeah you know so that that was my feeling on it and then even though i'd love to hang out with all these these uh, uh these people and then the yeah you know other comments he had like that section at the end about the fans was something that he said at the very end of the final interview and i it was in it was out it was in as that in the end i was like look i need to cut something i need to like it's two and a half hours long i need to cut it down so yeah. i cut all that section out um, and he said, look, I, you know, we talked a lot about the legacy of the band and the, the, the and what it maybe meant that moment in time. And that, none of that is in the film. And I was like, no, nope, that's a that's a good point. And it wasn't this wasn't him saying, I think it's important that I told you know, he was just saying like, that I think you need to kind of talk a little bit about what what that moment in time meant. Yeah, which yeah. Is a good, good point. So then I cut something else out and we put that back in. But his comments weren't you know, none of it was like, oh, Liam can't say that or shouldn't say yeah. this or whatever. You know, I think it was uh, it was. It was very smart. It was about the filmmaking rather than about anyone's egos, which was amazing. I think, I think it was. I think it was very really wise that you chose Nebworth to be the climax of the movie. Like the whole story was building up to the biggest moment of of Britain's music history, and I think that was a perfect send off. Because by the end of it, because when me and my brother watched it as brothers, and half the time you were like, "These guys are knobheads. What the hell are they doing?" <laughs> Right, but at the end, when it all like it comes to a crescendo, and like you see them performing at Nebworth, the two brothers, it ends with the master plan, and the master plan is basically, in my opinion, the master plan is basically Noel talking to Liam, sort of, 
So it sort of ends in such a high that you don't, you, you kind of forget even that they're broken up or whatever the history is after that. I think that's, that's yeah. a beautiful, beautiful end to that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, I think, I think you know, because we've talked to, in, yeah, and we talked to, would, would you ever want to do about, uh, do a, a sequel or what about then what happens and so on? And I think the problem is, it's like, Danger with a lot of the bands, as soon as they become big, it becomes the same story, which is we record an album, you tour the album, you like each other, you hate each other. It, it becomes the same yeah. story. Was generally speaking, the ascent is what's interesting and what's unique. Yeah. And whether that's the Beatles or it's Coldplay or Radiohead or, 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 yeah. or um, Oasis, it's right. It's like, okay, well, that it feels to me that beyond that point, it's nice to go out on a high as well because we know what happened. You, all the seeds are in there. Like, what's yeah. the point of discussing that? Oh, yeah, another. Two years later, they had an argument. It's like, well, yeah, of course, they had arguments all the time. So I, yeah. it felt to me that's a way of celebrating it and also kind of, it's, it has a bittersweet, nostalgic feel to it. You don't need to keep on going. Um, For sure. Even though everything else that happened, I mean, I love the, uh, the albums that come later. I, it's not, I mean, the first two, uh, I think everyone, even the band acknowledged that that was the peak, but there's some, yeah, um, the like you said, there's some amazing songs that came after. Yeah. Uh, amazing albums that came after. Yeah. I better go. Oh. The garden. Ah, oh, we just wanted to talk to you about more about Coldplay and stuff. Well, but that's okay. Well, that that's fine. Anytime. Yeah, look, I'm I'm not going anywhere. In common with most of the world, so anytime you want to talk, <laughs> I'm I'm around. Yeah, but thank you very much for your generous time. Honestly, yeah. um, this was wonderful. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. We've been your a fan of your work um for a while now, even though we didn't know what it was. Paradise's video is embedded into my mind, uh, and it takes me back to my Karachi days all the time. So, so thank you for your work. Awesome. Awesome. Thank, Thank you so, so much. much. And then okay, take care. The Give lots of love to the kids and the wife and, and happy Easter to you. Yeah, happy Easter. Take care. Thank Have you. A time to take bye, care. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye.